welcome or welcome back to booktube with amy so today's going to be another try that trope reading vlog and um i'm filming on my phone and see the use of my camera because meantime we're going to go away on holiday while i film this vlog and i don't really want to hump my camera and my battery packs and my lens and chargers and the foo shenanigans um, so we're just gonna do it on my phone and see how we go. Like I say, we're going on holiday, so hopefully I'll get some really good bureau for you guys and you'll be able to see where we are. We're going up to a town called Connell, which is just like outside of Oban, up in the north of Scotland, and it's just one of your favourite places to go. Um, we always tend to go on holiday up round about the Oban area, and this will be your first holiday that we've had since before COVID. So we're both very very excited about it. Um, planning to get so much book read, just relax, listen to the rain, watch the waves, drink all the tea, it's going to be phenomenal. So I thought because it's spooky season, it's October, and because we're going to be going away up north, and um, we're going to be quite secluded, that the trope that I would try this week is seclusion. So I am going to be reading Stolen Tongues, and um, I've already spoke about this on the channel before. It's been recommended to me by Jem from Bookish Gems because she read it and was like genuinely scared reading it. And so I was like, that is a wee book, I need that. And I'd says like, I'm going to read that when I go away up north because it's about a couple who is secluded and um, some spooky goings on starts happening. Um, maybe a wee bit supernatural. So I was like, I'm going to read that when I go away. And see you know if the fact that I am away enhances it at all um, and I totally freak myself out and then I am also going to read The Sanatorium by Sarah Pierce because this one again is like a it's a bit of a I think a murder mystery I think the main character is a detective which isn't something I usually go for like I don't really like detective stories at all but this one is set like out in the middle of nowhere there's just no storm and everybody is locked in um, and I think that that could be quite interesting and I've seen a few people review this um, I think last year it got quite a bit of hype when it was actually released because like it's a series and the second one is out now so I'm late to the party as always but um, it's meant to be quite creepy so we'll see. I wanted to basically just pick two books that were a wee bit spooky given it was October and you know the fact that we're going to be in the middle of nowhere <laughs> um, will just enhance my reading experience, hopefully. So I think I am going to start with Stolen Tongues because I'm super hyped for that. Um, I am not going to read that though until we're up there. So today while I'm travelling on the coach, I'm going to be reading another book, but I will maybe get some like footage um, of the mountains and stuff as we're going, depending on how nice it is. Um, if the weather is abysmal, then I probably won't. But I will catch up with you either later on today um, and show you where we're staying or it'll be tomorrow. so far so I'm not a huge deal into it but I'm hoping to get through a decent wee chunk today but I am really enjoying this so far like there is ugh, no build up at all I feel like the first page there is creepy stuff happening which is just brilliant and like totally my preference like I don't mind some build up but I feel like horror needs less build up I feel like you can tell the story as you go and sometimes it's creepier just to be thrown in and not really know what's happening and just have to like figure it out as it's happening to the characters. I always just think that, that helps with the atmosphere and this has been absolutely gripping so far. I can't wait to read more yet. The intro to this, like where the animals are starting to act a bit weird and um, the parrot and the dogs are like reacting to something that might be there was just like so terrifying and that is something that like really scares me. I hate if I am in the house of mine and like Bailey does that weird thing. We have like a glass door in our living room 
so if I'm in the house on my own and we're maybe in the living room and I've got the door closed and he only really barks if there's somebody at our front door or if he can see somebody walking past that glass living room door and I hate it when he does that and I'm like, Bailey stop it because like had I, had I need to know, the wee ghosts are there. Um, so I, I really really love that and I think I'm going to enjoy this a lot. Our, um, well, one of our main characters, Faye, she has like an undiagnosed sleep condition. They haven't said specifically what it is, but she has been like talking to the voices that they are hearing in this cabin and her sleep, <sighs> chilling. Like that, ooh, terrifies me. I can't deal with that. Um, <laughs> I talk a lot in my sleep, and so like, it just terrifies me. I, I wouldn't like to think that I was having conversations with somebody else in my sleep. That's horrible. But um, I am going to read a wee bit more of this today and then I will update you when I have later thoughts. But I thought just now I would show you where we were staying for the week. So this is our cottage for the week. This is done funerary house um, and oh, it's just so gorgeous. We are like right on the waters of Loch Etve. We stayed here before um, pre-pandemic. Like it's got a lovely wee re reading nook right in there and we're like right on the waters I'll take you around and show you so this is Loch Etve and um, the, this side of the cottage is all big glass windows so we can see this from our living room and from our wee kitchen dining room area which is just gorgeous and there are like <laughs> loads of um, ducks that you see passing, there are otters in this loch as well um, which is really cool and really fun to see. They tend to um, stay like further out in the loch so probably no manage to get a huge amount of footage and then just down there um, is Connell Bridge and um, we normally take wee walks down to the bridge and stuff along the shore side and it is really really lovely so we enjoy that and then we've got a wee wood burning fire as well so that'll be getting lit and we'll be reading Fireside at some point this week Just shy halfway through this, um, just about to start part three. <sighs> this is like properly creepy as fuck. It is brilliant. And I feel like we didn't really have like a huge deal of background at all on these characters. And so we're sort of just like getting things as they happen. And our main character Felix is our narrator. And it's interesting to see like what he's willing to share and what he's not shared yet and maybe like what he knows about Faye um, and what he is yet to learn. It's so exciting. There is something like properly dark and disturbing happening um, and <laughs> I'm really enjoying it and I probably could just finish this but I'm going to take a break and probably read some more of this tomorrow because I really didn't want to rush it because it is just brilliant and I definitely want to get some of this read when it is dark and creepy outside and I've got the fire going because I just think that will be like peak atmosphere but aye, this is so good. I'm so interested in finding out what's happening and like I wasn't sure at the beginning because the way that this sets it up is like it's like oh and the events say what happened like scarred me for life and you know I hate that like didn't do that to try and make me want to read and so that annoys me um but it hasn't been like that actually as we've been going through it's been pretty fast paced which I'm loving but um, I have so many questions at this point and I'm just hoping that I get like a really decent answer to them and that it wraps up well because that's always my worry I think when like we're, we're going and you know I haven't had any answers yet and I've maybe got main answers but I'm hopeful so I will catch up with you when I've had more thoughts. <laughs>
my stolen tongues and I've had quite a lot of thoughts. Um, it was solid up until the end. Um, the ending was awful, personally. Um, I hated it. It was total shit. And um, <laughs> it was really like overclouding my overall experience of the book, I feel, um, because I'm pretty disappointed. I think that Felix Blackwell has got some immense writing in here. Like, he writes oh, just fantastically. And the, like, the speech element of the monster, like, mimicking other people's speech and, like, trying to gain their trust and, like, get made information and getting everything that he is getting through people's dreams is like terrifying and it is written so so well that was like the standout in this book for me to be honest every scene where the monster is on page like we didn't need to necessarily see the monster and it doesn't need to be described in a huge amount of detail um, for him to be completely and utterly terrifying because what he is saying and what we know he is doing in itself is terrifying and that was brilliant. I really liked all of the lore throughout this book and um, I really also enjoyed our main character. So Felix is the name of our main character and um, I, I guess the isolation aspect to this like seclusion, isolation, that's the trope I'm supposed to be trying out. Like, I, I did enjoy it in this book. It obviously starts off in quite an isolated setting where they're in this cabin, and that is obviously terrifying. Like, miles away from civilization. if anything happens, you're fucked. Like, that is in itself scary. Um, but I think isolation in this is better portrayed by the fact that Felix is almost in this on his own, because Faye is the in calling out to this creature in her sleep and she's doing it subconsciously and she can't help it and this creature has some sort of like fascination with her and so like it is literally just him in the dead of night like even when they're back home in a city and there are people around like there's fuck all he can do about it like he can't do anything to stop her and so he is just so in it on his own and like his in-laws know stuff and they're not really wanting to divulge and they're not wanting to be a part of it um, his sister in laws the same, his pals have tried to help out, but they're like, listen, we're too freaked out, like, we can't be dealing with this. And so he is just completely left on his own to deal with this entire situation. And I think that he's written brilliantly because he's terrified and you can really feel his fear, you can feel his anger, but you can also really get his love for Faye and, like, wanting to do absolutely everything they can to try and save her and to try and solve this for her no matter what the cost is and I just really enjoyed that. I thought that the characters in here were written brilliantly. Um, Faye, Felix and the monster. Everybody else was just a bit meh. Um, I didn't really buy into her in-laws really no wanting to help or the sister and I feel like Felix's pals as well. Like We didn't really get any character development there. They were just there for plot progression which was a wee bit annoying because we know I, I quite love a side character but um, I did really enjoy it. It's just the ending let me down. I'm going to spoil it. So if you are not interested in spoilers, then like click away to the next clip. Um, so basically at the end, like this monster has followed them for this remote cabin, like all the way through to like where they stay now. And apparently this monster has been after Faye since she was five. And, um, you know, this number five keeps cropping up and cropping up and cropping up. And, you know, you're led to believe that it's because this all started when Faye was five and that's when, like, her sleep condition started, blah, blah, blah. But it is not. Um, it's that her mum was pregnant with another child and their family would have then been five and Faye couldn't deal with any of that as a child and, like, repressed it all. Um, but I feel like that was pretty predictable based on, like, her mum and dad's behaviours. Like, so I sort of saw that coming. Um... But anyway, that all comes out, which is like allows Faye to sort of deal with all this grief and this whole monster this entire time has been like, what makes five? What makes five? What makes five? Because when Faye dreams, she dreams about the number five all the time and like her and the monster have been leaving we number fives, like communicating with each other everywhere in real life. Um, 
and you know he's just really interested as to what five means and so now that they know what five means they can sort of they appease him and they can let him know so they decide they're going to like call this monster to the hoops and have like a wee confab and be like here by the way this is what five means uh, and so they do that and then Faye just says to the monster like no you know what five means bugger off like I, like, I don't I don't want to be with you I'm not coming with you like this is my life bolt and the monster's just like oh but I love you like I've travelled all this way to find you and she's just like I saw his mate bolt and the monster just bolts like I, I just I really don't think so like that is just like a really really weak ending to me that was like a I don't want them to magically kill him and then for everything to be fine but I don't know how else to end it end him um, very weak I uh, didn't enjoy it at all I think that you know this monster has spent months and months and months stalking them and learning about their life and invading her dreams and now invading Felix's dreams he's you know like made totems out of the, their engagement ring he's terrorised their pals and um, has learned to mimic like everybody who's close to the two of them to try and gain some sort of a trust and to gain access into their life like he's not just going to be like oh you didn't like me cool no bother sorry about that and like crack back on his mountain like that makes absolutely no sense at all and I'm very, very disappointed by how it ended. Um, the other thing to talk about this book is that it talks a lot about um, Native Americans and Indigenous people. The story that like the monster is based on all comes from Native American folklore. And Felix Blackwell at the end of the book like talks about that a bit and was saying, you know, in a world where we're trying to raise up own voices, is it appropriate for him to have told this story and to have included Native American characters in his story? Um, and ultimately, like, I think he thinks he's done it for the right reasons, but I still am not necessarily sure if it was the right choice. He um, studied history and one of his history teachers was Native American. And so he uh, he is very passionate about trying to, you know, bring forward the, the plight and raise awareness for the struggles of Native American people um, and Indigenous groups. Specifically in America, because he is American, but he does acknowledge it happens in loads of other countries in the world. And, like, I think that that's brilliant. Um, and, like, he says, you know, like, he wanted to write them as people. He didn't want to, you know, play any stereotypes, which we often see specifically in horror. And, you know, he wanted to steer away from that and just have them be people um, and to write them like he would write any other characters which I think is obviously brilliant like and we need to do that because people they just play on stereotypes and don't they actually any research into the groups of people that they are trying to rape um, which is frustrating. I feel like he has um, but he says that he reached out to loads of his colleagues and like people he worked with um, to, to talk about whether or no he should include them in here and should like tell this story and resoundingly they all said no and he still did and so I'm like right if like you're thinking about whether or no you should portray this group you ask members of this group and they say no probably still shouldn't do it anyway like maybe it would be better for somebody else to have told this story and then he also says like that he didn't want to pick like a particular Native American like tribe or group um, because like the lore is all quite intermingled and he didn't want to like pick a specific group and write them badly or offend them in any way and so he just like made shit up um, and you know the, the two indigenous characters who are in here he just like made up a tribe and says oh this is where they're free and like made up all their lore stuff which also feel is just a wee bit of a miss because I think that if you're going to the effort to raise awareness and to write for a certain perspective at least do the fucking research and have it be accurate. Like, Danny then put a chapter at the end of your book being like, oh, I know people will maybe question this, so, like, I just made it up. Like, no. Like, if you're going to try and promote a message for a group of people or show that they are more than they are portrayed and loads of other forms of media, like, Danny just makes you up. Do the research, portray them properly. Like... And then have this be meaningful, like in a piece of literature that they would maybe really buy into and really enjoy, like and really support, because you're not just saying they are 
mystical, magical beings who can solve everything. Like you're saying they are real people, these are their histories and this is their story that I'm telling. But to then just say, oh, I just made it up, like, so that I didn't offend anybody, really annoyed me because I feel like if you're going to do it, even though you've been told you shouldn't do it, do it right and I didn't feel like you did. Um, so I am not going to rate this book at the minute because I'm pretty conflicted. Um, just we all that and then also how the book ended. I think if I was to rate it right now I'd rate it pretty low but I think I need to think on it because I really did enjoy like three quarters of the book. It was just the last part of the book that really let me down. Um, but in terms of the seclusion trope, I did really enjoy that aspect of it and you just need to decide whether or not I actually enjoyed this book. Um, well, I did enjoy parts of it, but how much I've enjoyed it um, for my rating. So in the next clip, I'll probably let you know what I've rated it and I'll hopefully get the sanatorium started as well. <laughs> I have decided I'm going to give this one a three star. I think that if I was to rate it really really low it wouldn't reflect my experience of the book because Felix Blackwell really created a really creepy environment. He created a book where I was enthralled up until the last part and you know the monster was creepy or the communication was creepy the stuff with the animals was creepy and i had a really great time being freaked out by this book and this is probably one of the books that has freaked me out the most this year if i'm honest and so i feel like you know my, my rating needs to reflect that um but my rating also needs to reflect the end of the book which really let it down and so I think three star, middle of the road is probably the fairest place to put this. And, you know, part of my rating is going to um, involve my views on the author's comments on Indigenous people and, um, you know, his views on his portrayal of Native Americans. And that's just the type of reader I am. You know, I try to read critically. I have views and opinions and I'm here to express them. Um, and so that will always affect my rating. I talk all the time about responsible consumerism and, you know, calling out trash authors. And I think that it's fair that his comments and my reservations around them reflect in my rating of this book. So it's a three star, middle of the road. I think that if maybe you're just looking for a good time, and you're not really necessarily interested in like a well-rounded wrap-up of a plot. If you're just looking for a freaky time, then maybe this is going to be a wee bit made up your street. But I need questions to be answered, <laughs> like, and I need a better ending than that. So I have started The Sanatorium this morning by Sarah Pierce. Now, I am not too far into this at all. I am up to page 45. Um, the premise of this is like it's a crime thriller. Um, so your main detective is actually off duty and she has been up to her brother's like engagement party wedding party thing and he's holding it at this old sanatorium out in the middle of nowhere that has been converted into a luxury hotel now <sighs> crime thrillers are not normally my bag if i'm reading the blurb of a book and i see something about a detective almost immediately I am turned off and I will put the book down because I really don't enjoy police procedurals. I, I just I can't invest into them when it's in a book form. I really like police procedural TV shows but I feel like I'm investing less into a TV show, um, less time, less effort, whereas with a book I just didn't want to have to put it in. Um, but I, I really like sanatoriums and insane asylums. You know that mental institution environment is just so creepy to me and something that I really really enjoy. There is a wee place um, just a couple of towns over from where I grew up called Bangower and um, Bangower was an entire town that was built um, and it was an insane asylum and you know the 
or the nurses who worked there had their own accommodation on site. There was the big buildings for all the different wards, all the different mental patients. It had a standard hospital as well. It has a shop, it had a church slash chapel. Like everything that you needed was on that one wee town um, and buses would go to and from there every single day. And that got shut down um, and so it has never been built on. Nothing has ever been done with it. It's just this wee ghost town that sits um, and I just think that's so fascinating and so creepy. You can go to Bangor and you can walk around the grounds. Um, it's quite a, a dog walking hotspot these days and I have been there so many times. Um, and Journey is the host train or the building, but um, you can. And you know, there's still like medical equipment lying around. The place is supposed to be like super haunted. Um, so there are always like sightings of ghosts there and stuff um, and that is just my bag right like I love it love it love it I have said for about this is a tangent but anyway I have said for like a million years that if I won the lottery that I would buy Van Gower in its entirety um, and like I would juice it all up um, I wouldn't need to open it as a mental asylum but I would take the big um, blocks that were there for the medical wards, I would make them into flats, I would take some of the separate buildings and I would make them individual houses, I would rent the shop out, I would reopen the church and I would have that as like a wee function in town and um, like one of the buildings I would make a museum and like have it or um, you know have tell the story of Bangor and visitors could come and visit it, um, that would be my dream. So like that is how into insane asylums and sanatoriums and stuff I am, right? Um, <laughs> I'm a bit of a Bangor geek also, so I love it. Anyway, tangent. Um, so that is what drew me to pick up this book. If this book was in any other setting, I probably wouldn't have given it a chance, um, but I have decided to based on that, because the geek in me couldn't know. I have liked what I've read so far. So it starts off with a really creepy opening sequence of the guy who I'm assuming has decided to convert it into a hotel. Um, and I really enjoyed that. He, again, this is going to be spoilery, so don't even watch this if you don't like spoilers. But um, he uh, gets murdered. He gets stabbed by a man in a creepy old gas mask. Such a mood. Love it. Um, and then we sort of feel jump forwards into modern day we are we have our detective who is like making our way up this mountain um to go see our brother and she apparently hasn't seen him in a long time now the book is very creepy and it's really emphasizing how isolated they are up here like the road to get up here is shit and um the weather isn't the greatest which means driving conditions are poor and it's really set the scene just how isolated they are up here, which is ridiculously creepy and I'm really enjoying. But what I am enjoying so much so far is like most thrillers, um, crime thrillers, mysteries, whatever, the author is like alluding to stuff that I yet don't know. Um, so she is alluding to, you know, a wee bit of an issue between her and her brother based on some stuff that happened in the past and how his fiance doesn't really know about any of that. Um, there's some like friend group drama that is also happening um, that we didn't know the background of and that just really isn't my cup of tea. I really don't enjoy that. Like I would rather you just hold me up front and then like I'd know and then we can move on like or we can explore it with your characters and have it be a really great development point and you know maybe a moment for me to really connect with them um but no i just hate like teasing you with it and then no actually telling you anything so we'll see how we get on uh, i'm going to do some more reading today so i will maybe catch you up today or i will catch you up tomorrow you will see <laughs>
100 pages into the sanatorium and I just, I'm really loving it so far. <laughs> um, oh, I like the fact it's set in the sanatorium and I think that that's really creepy and I'm really enjoying the like isolation aspect of it. I think that, you know, they're stuck up there and um, the main character's brother's fiance has went missing and, you know, we didn't know what is going on. Um, our main character and her brother have like a really weird relationship and there is something going on there that has been hinted at but she definitely thinks that her brother has something to do with his fiance going missing and like that's very chilling because like you wouldn't think that your sibling was capable of murder and so you know if you're like quite a hardened police detective and that is your assumption um, then like Bit concerning, isn't it? But um, I, I, I'm liking that dynamic because they're obviously up there on their own, they're stuck away from everybody, and your main character is trying to navigate like helping find the fiance while also suspecting her brother, will no want to let her brother know that she suspects him because they're in the middle of nowhere and she doesn't want to end up dead. And I am enjoying that, but I am not enjoying all the like wee tidbits that are being thrown in along the way. So I am not enjoying the the fact that we didn't really know a lot about our main character so far. She is like insert generic detective here. We know nothing, um, but we know she's on a break for work eh, and has taken a extended period of absence to care for her mum who just recently died of cancer. But the break for work was spurred on by, you've probably guessed, a really big case. Um, so she is just like copy and pasted for any big detective series I feel, you know, traumatised by a previous case. We didn't really know what the previous case is, but we're probably going to find out, blah, blah, blah. Boring, I am not interested. It's been done 20,000 times before. We also, like, there's been stuff hinted about her and her brother also had a younger brother. So she's the oldest, the brother in this is the middle, and then the younger brother is dead. And I feel like it's sort of hinted that she believes her brother killed her other brother, um, although nothing has yet been confirmed. And again, it's like, oh, stop this. Like, just tell me what you're thinking. Give me your reasoning as to why, because it'd be a far more interesting read, like if we had all this information, because then when her and her brother are having interactions, we can use all that background information for that to then be more interesting and for there to be this other dimension added to it, whereas at the minute, like there is not. Um, and then there's also stuff being threaded in about our main character, um, Ellen, by the way, sorry, I uh, didn't know if I've ever said her name. Her and um, her brother's fiance, Lor. So they were childhood friends. Something has happened, and they were no longer friends. And so um, there was like a moment between them as well. And your main character's like, "Oh, this is like the old Lor, and you know, like blah blah blah." But she's gone, and you know, we'll never have what we had. And like, oh, I'm just so so sick of it because there's so much yet. It's like try to thread you through points of the main storyline, then backstory, you know, for our main character's absence, and then backstory about the murder of the brother, and then backstory about her relationship with her now estranged living brother, and then backstory with her and the fiance, and it is just a bit much. Um, I think that is very lazy writing. And it is in no way encouraging me to continue wanting to pick up the book. I reckon I'm going to give it another 50 pages. And if it has not gripped me within 50 pages, then I'm probably going to DNF. Um, and I have not DNF'd anything so far for this Try That Trope series. Um, even though I have wanted to, um, I have not. But like, I feel like for what I've read of the book and what I've enjoyed for it, the only bit of it I'm enjoying is the seclusion sanatorium aspect of it. So in terms of I try that trope, I think that it's still fair to say that I like that trope. I might just not necessarily like this book. But if I already know that I like it, then I don't see a need for me to continue. But I'll catch up with you tomorrow because I am not going to read any more yet today. Like I just cannot.
Um, it's annoying, it's really frustrating. I'm not quite understanding why this book is getting so much hype and so much love as it is at the minute. Because um, I personally think that I could write a better crime novel than this. But we'll see how we go. So we spent mostly yesterday reading and I am up to page 229. I am no too far off the end. And I know I spoke about DNF in this book, and to be honest, like, it hasn't improved. But, um, it's sort of for, like, you know when you watch a really crappy film, but, like, you're like, well, I'm going to need to see how it ends now. It's a bit like that. Um, it's not the most enjoyable book I've ever read, to be honest. And while some of the, like, drip, drip, drip in the information, the teasy stuff, has been resolved, no, at this point, it's still like a lingering frustration for me because that is just probably one of my least favourite things ever. And like, again, I appreciate that that's quite common in the thriller genre, but I just feel like if the writing's decent, then it doesn't really need to do that. Um, the one thing that I am enjoying about this book is the isolation, the seclusion, which is obviously brilliant because that's the trope I was trying out. And I'm really enjoying the murder scenes. Like, the murder scenes in here are properly creepy and gruesome. And that culminated with this brilliantly, beautifully described, isolated setting. And this old sanatorium is properly creepy. And I am enjoying that. But then it's just like when nobody's being murdered, that's a wee bit boring. Uh, so, maybe if it was mere horror then I would be enjoying it a wee bit more than I am. Um, there's some stuff in here that I just think is a wee bit ridiculous and like I think that the author has put them in to try and make it a wee bit twisty and a wee bit more interesting however it's just like eye-rollingly bad to me uh, so our main character like I had said in my previous clip she believes that her brother who she is estranged with um, and the reason she is estranged with him is because she believes that he killed the younger brother um, that obviously wasn't the case and what had happened was is she witnessed her younger brother die and she was so traumatised by it that she like repressed it and her brain like basically made shit up which made her suspect it was the brother like and that just didn't really need to be in there like she could have had an estranged relationship with her brother for any other reason like her brother was near about when her mum died of cancer and she took this big period of leave to care for her. Like, that could have been reason enough. Like, or they could have just, like, had nothing in common and decided not to be close. Like, that happens. Like, it didn't need to be some mad reason. I really didn't understand why the deed brother is in here because the author hasn't, like, explored it enough in terms of how it has really affected, like, their relationship as brother and sister, how it's, like, really affected like her relationship with her mum, you know, his relationship with his mum, her as a mother because she is dead for the entirety of the book. And so I feel like if you're going to put something like that in, then you should really do like a deep delve into your characters so that we can see like all the ramifications of that. And the author has not. It's just there like to make a wee bit of tension between those two characters, which is resolved. Um, about halfway through the book and so is therefore unneeded. It's a wee bit of a distraction for the main storyline. I feel like it's there to distract you for the main storyline because if the main storyline was the only storyline in this book, it could have been wrapped up within like, it could have been a novella, right, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, also, there's some stuff in here that is just like, so bad. <laughs> like, our main character is supposed to be like a shit hot detective. Ellis is supposed to be like absolutely cracking, which is why her boss is like asking her if she's coming back because they want her to be solving all these crimes. She's supposed to be amazing. But there's like elements in here that read almost like a cosy mystery detective who obviously are made detectives. Like at one point there's a character in here and they're looking for her in the hotel and the character has like a, a nervous fidgety thing where she picks off like her nail polish and they can't find this character anywhere and then they foley a trail in nail polish chips to find this character. Like say if that was a cosy mystery where your main character isn't a detective, fine, I'd accept that and it would be quite quirky and cute, right? 
But for me to believe that Ellis is like a properly trained detective, but the bitch is finding people be like nail polish chips on the flare. I'm sorry, but no. I just, I really am not enjoying it, but I have the audiobook and I've got like an hour left on the audiobook. So I think I'm probably just going to try and wrap it up now. Um, because it's just a bit dull and I want to get it finished. But like, I want to see it in its entirety for the sake of the vlog. So I am not going to DNF it, even though I probably should. <laughs> Um, I didn't really have a huge amount more to say than I have already said in my previous clips on this book, to be honest. Maybe the reason I decided to finish it was the fact that, you know, I was secluded up here with limited books. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is a one star read for me, to be honest. The only elements of the book that I enjoyed were the actual description of the sanatorium and the creepiness of the people being murdered there and the fact that it was as secluded as it was. Um, other than that, I was not a huge fan, to be honest. Um, you know, the, the person that this ended up being as well, although it wasn't somebody who was immediately in my like suspect list, like, so I get that that was a twist, but I hate when thrillers do this, when they make it a twist to somebody that you just didn't really give a fuck about. Like, the person who's doing the murders in here, I'm going to spoil it, so... Dig your, dig your back. Um, the person who's doing the murders in here is the sister, the guy who owns the hotel. And, you know, she's just jealous because he has done this with his life and sort of cut her out of it. And she has not like a part of it. And so obviously, a rational progression is that you're going to start killing his guests and like his architect and like other people to do with the project so that the project gets a bad name like obviously that's what he did as opposed to just having a conversation like a rational human and saying oh look listen I think this would be cool if it was something we did together like can I buy in no of course no obviously you resort to murder obviously um I feel like the build up in here is absolutely ridiculous like Although somebody is killed in like the intro and so like action is happening, that's not what I mean. But like the murders and the wrap up to that is explained in the last two chapters and the chapters in this book are super short. So like you maybe get like 10 pages of the story being wrapped up compared to like however many pages of it being built up. I just feel like the ending was very rushed and there is definitely shit in this book that could have been cut early on that added absolutely no dramatic tension, no room for character development and was just in there to check a box on the I can write a mediocre thriller that will be sold in the supermarket's box on her list. Um, aye, no a fan, it was a one star didn't really enjoy it. If I was to compare the two books, I enjoyed Stolen Tongues more than I enjoyed The Sanatorium. That is reflected in my rating. Stolen Tongues got a three, The Sanatorium got a one. I really enjoyed the trope of eh, seclusion and isolation. I think that that is something that I will definitely look for going forward in books. And maybe, you know, if it's in another thriller, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I just don't think that this is necessarily the thriller for me. Um, but I have read some in the past that I have enjoyed. But I, I don't think that the genre would necessarily affect this trope. I enjoyed that element in both books. Um, if you know, you're know you looking to be absolutely terrified, definitely pick up Stolen Tongues. You know, if you're maybe looking for a wee bit maybe a generic murder mystery maybe then pick up the sanatorium but I did enjoy um the the trope in both books and it has definitely been heightened by you know the fact that we are up here in a wee secluded cabin um it's been very great and very creepy to be lying reading them well like if it's pitch black outside surrounded by trees and woods and water and the fire's been going it's been absolutely brilliant 
Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you're enjoying everything that you are reading at the moment. And I will catch you in the next one. Bye. Look at the hole. I can't. What do you mean you can't? Look how deep the hole is. You sure that's not just a step you're standing in front of? No, it's a hole, a fell! Why? I want to put my step. Look, step out of the hole. It's a huge hole. Well, jump out of the hole then. Oh, it's alright, I've not smashed my phone. I wasn't asking about your phone. Oh, you need to you move if I'm going to be getting out of this. Right, go on then. <sighs> I could oh, offer you a hand, that. but it's difficult I'm to lunching. film. I can't even stand up here. My legs are too short. I live here now. Welcome to my hole. Fuck's sake. Ugh. Don't fall backwards, don't fall backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking open.